everybody, and welcome to our first panel. This is on how to survive going to a Renaissance Fair festival completely in garb, or really any questions you have for us on surviving a fair. Uh, between all of your panelists that you see, there are over 15 different fairs that we've gone to and over 50 years of experience dressing up for Renaissance festivals. Um, so I'm just going to go down. I'm going to introduce you uh, to your panelists. They'll give a brief fact about themselves. Um, my name's Kate. I'm one of the admins on Selling for Renaissance Festivals. I'll be uh, your moderator and I'll be reading all your comments in chat. So if you have any questions that come up at any time, feel free to put it into chat. I'll make sure that they come up to our panelists and that we can discuss it um, at, at an appropriate time or if it's pertinent to the conversation going on right then and there throw it into the mix. So first up, we have Kathy. Kathy is another admin on Sewing for Renaissance Festivals, and she's going to take it over from there. Hello, my name is Kathy. You probably see me online as Kathy, K-A-F-E-E, -E, that's me. Um, I have been going to Renaissance Festivals for quite a long time. Um, I would say yeah, once, once I started teaching 28 years ago, I started going. I absolutely love it. Drag my partner with me. He's great about it. Um, but yeah, I had to have somebody, like, I wanted to ask somebody about this, and I did, but most of getting used to dressing in fairs was about trial and error. Oh my God, was it about trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Christy. Hi. Um, I've been going to Renaissance fairs too for quite some time. Um, I am in love with everything Tudor. Um, yeah. Okay, and Suzanne? Hi, um, I'm representing the South, so y'all can just go ahead and start with the comments about the accent. I get it. We <laughs> do sound like this. Um, I've been doing Renaissance fairs for about five years with my husband, who's a big D&D'er, -er, and we dress for 95 degree weather, so I'll be covering the heat. And then we have Angodin. Hello, I've been doing FCA and Ren fairs for the past, oh, about 18 years now, and I do mostly German Ren and Tudor. Okay. Uh, so we, I do see we have our first question on chat, but I thought we'd start it out um, in a slightly more serious uh, note. Uh, I did take questions ahead of time on a survey. So a question we received was how to politely exit a conversation with someone who wants to argue bigoted viewpoints, um, such as there are no Black people at the Renaissance. Why are you all dressed up? There are no Black people at the Renaissance. Um, so... With that said, I'm going to throw it over to the panel. Hello. I guess I should probably address that one, don't you think? Just a little bit for it, Kathy. <laughs> I can't say that I've had anyone come up to me and directly say that in person at a fair. Because nine times out of 10, um, at my own fair, you know, we all know each other. We all hang around in the same spot. And anybody who comes up can see, you know, this is a whole group of people who all know each other. And so they're not going to start anything. But even uh, going to other fairs, uh, Florida, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, um, I haven't run into a lot of that. Um, where I do run into it is online. Um, because people are more willing to argue about it online than they are in person. Um, and that part's easy. You just scroll on. You just scroll on. Um, there are a couple of groups I had to leave because it just, it, it was too much. I'm like, if this is where your opinions are, I'm, I'm not so sure I want to deal with that. Um, but then some of those same people I would see at the fair and they're perfectly fine with it. Um, but what I do tell them is that no, that's not true that there were no Black people back in medieval Renaissance, dark ages. They were always there. We were always there. Um, even in nobility, nobility, peasant, middle class, um, silk weavers, princes, that kind of thing. Um, a couple of rumors about uh, King James the Fourth for uh, sixth, King James the Sixth 
for instance. Um, but yes, there were Black people there, whether they were working, whether they were royalty, whether they were um, escaping something from their own country or dignitaries coming in, um, they did exist. So um, there's a, oh, what is that book called? It's about, it's a, it's a book about 10 stories of Black either merchants or royalty in Elizabethan and Tudor, uh, well, Tudor, Henry Tudor and Elizabethan times. And I can't remember, I think it's called the Black Tudors. Does anybody there is that? a story called the Black Tudors and there, yeah. there's so much information out there available that you could look it up and do your history. I've gotten this at our fair. We are in the South. Mm -hmm. um, we have a huge diverse type of people that come to our fair. Um, and I, we got it. We got it this past March. My fair was only three weeks ago. I'm still recovering. But um, we say to them what we say to anybody who has a grief about us not being historically accurate on any platform, race, uh, drinking apparatus, garb, whatever they're complaining about, we say we are here to celebrate history and everyone is invited to celebrate. And then we just move on. Um, we try to keep it quick and we always have exit lines. In fact, our nobility and our royalty require us to have five exit lines on hand at any given point. And we have to recite them to our queen. So, um, you know, we, we try to exit from the situation, but we also make sure that they know that everyone is included in our group and it won't be tolerated. That's all. I will say there's a great YouTube channel called um, Use and Dionysus who um, actually focus their whole YouTube channel on this topic. Uh, they are a um, racially diverse couple. And I think that they um, identify on uh, LGBTQ plus as well, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but I'm pretty sure they do. I know they do speak a lot to that as well. Um, they have covered this topic much more in depth than we can in this panel and they focus their whole channel on it. I highly recommend taking a look at them and they're just spectacular people. I actually got to speak to her at a sew along for something else. Um, so she's just spectacular. Um, so with the that- oh. thing, I will say this, I will say this. If you see it happen, and especially if it's a friend of yours, but whether or not it's a friend of yours, please back them up. Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of mix the serious topics with the still important topics, but things that are a little bit more fun to talk about. So we just had a serious and here's our next one. How do you sit potty and function in a hoop skirt? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, no. Um, no it's possible. It is possible. Um, you're, you know, a hoop skirt can actually be to your advantage to being able to manipulate that much fabric mm -hmm. more easily. Um, people think that just because it's wide and cumbersome that it's hard to manage. Those things fold like an accordion if they're done properly. Um, you can actually tie ties to the bottom. I have done this tied ribbons to the bottom so all you have to do is grab the ribbon and just pull right over your head that's, um, that's how we do it we have porta potties at my fair and um the big thing that I, I say about using the bathroom as a fair or being in any dirty place at the fair is it is a wide misconception that hems touch the ground that is not um historically accurate um Medieval periods up through the Renaissance was disgusting, especially in the streets where open sewage would flow. Skirts did not touch the ground. So do yourself a favor, hem it up, ladies. And um, if you're going to do a hoop, tie yourself some ties so that you can get it all the way over in the porta potty. <laughs> uh, and also in the porta potty, make sure you make the bowl. Um, oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> Make the bowl. So you bring the bottom up, whether you have ribbons or your hands, whatever it is you use, you bring the bottom up. And I just start taking my dress and piling it in inside the hoop and holding it with one hand. 
Um, you know, you got to back up till your heels hit the, <laughs> the Porta John uh, lid. Otherwise, you have no idea where you're aiming. Um, but yeah, the bowl is important. And then when you let it all down, it all just falls and you don't get the, the jack ups in the back. Yeah. Any other comments on that one? No, I think they're just porta potties. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Driving and sitting. Um, oh. As far oh, yeah. as sitting one. goes, um, nine times out of 10, like I have four hoops of all different sizes, and except for the two rung that they're only at the bottom, almost every one of them has a rung that hits me right at the butt. And if I sit down without doing anything, I'm going to sit on it. Um, since I do have bloomers on underneath, a lot of times if I'm sitting on a chair or a stool that doesn't have a back, I, I can just envelop the thing and just sit on it and look like I'm sitting on air. But um, otherwise I do have to take that rung that's at the butt and like, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Like, uh, where are my hands? Okay, flip it backwards so that you don't sit on it and end up with that mark across your butt and a numb butt. Um, in the car, that's a little harder. If you can, leave it off until you get to the fair. Yes, that's what I do. If you can, leave it off until you get to the fair. If you can't, because someone else is helping you get dressed at home or whatever, uh, the big thing is pile as much of it as you can in the driver's seat. Um, I've, I've gone to fair with my hoop up here and it's not pleasant. <laughs> no. But yeah, taking it off and leaving it until you get there is probably your best bet. It's a pretty common sight to see ladies dressing in the parking lot of a Renaissance fair. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So leave it off if you can. Don't be unsafe and, you know, get that thing tangled around your feet in the car. Um, but I, I have mine that ties on. My outer skirt ties on. Um, the farthingale's already in it, so the hoops, the layers of hoops. Um, and I slip, simply lay it on the ground, step inside of it, pull it up, and tie and proceed to my fair. A comment from the chat, uh, lift the butt level hoop up to your waist um, in, on, just in the back and then sit so that the front is kind of like scooped down. Um, we're lucky in PA, we have real bathrooms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I so love that fair. Yeah. Something else that works is having a like stretchy underlayer all the way on the bottom that can scoop up and envelop the whole thing. Cause then you can like basically like tie it up with the one hand with a drawstring and hold everything and just like the underlayer, um, go to the bathroom and then unzip, unzip or undrawstring or however you want to phrase it, it and it all falls back into place. So kind of similar to what Kathy does, but you can actually make a layer for that. They make them for wedding dresses if you don't want to figure out how to make them. Or a friend. A friend. Anybody else on this? Okay. Where to purchase boning and what kind is most comfortable for fluffy folks? And I'm going to use whatever terms they've used for themselves when I do this type of, because it's so for fluffy folks. I'm a fluffy uh, spiral steel is probably the best for anybody that wants to make a corset. It depends on your budget, of course, and what you can afford. Um, I know here in Pennsylvania of at least one store that carries corseting supplies in uh, Philadelphia. Um I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but it I think it's this I'm one. Time to go there. I think um, it's this one that I just put in the chat because they are based yeah, out of probably Philly. Probably is, um, but I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Uh, but that's probably it. Um, and they have it's it's not really expensive looking at price per piece of boning, but it does add up quickly when you're doing a fully boned corset. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, uh, you can, you can get away with using, um, like featherweight boning or plastic boning, or some people have used 
um zip like ties. industrial strength zip ties zip i have ties. A downstairs waiting to be finished of uh industrial strength zip ties so i'm not quite sure how that works for me yet but it's worked well for others just um, to throw so in a comment because people watching this later on youtube aren't going to see the chat the link that kathy put up into the chat is corsetmaking.com um and i will try to link it down below well, I've done the good. zip tie route. Um, I don't recommend doing the zip tie route if you're dealing with heat because you're basically wrapping yourself in plastic. Um, but the spiral steel is your best bet. It gives you the movement and the flexibility that you want being a plus size person. Um, when we sit down, there's shapes, you know, when we sit down that move on their own. Um, and the the spiral steel really is your best bet. I try to stay away from corseted boss bodices. Um, I have more of an at attempt to make bodices that are just um, channeled. I find that channeling um, with some good batting in between can give you that stiffness and uh, uh, kind of smooth look that you want in a corset with not actually having to be uh, boned but you still want the infrastructure. So I wear a stay with a uncorseted bodice over it um, instead of going with, you know, the traditional steel boning or zip ties on the outside bodice. Mine is on the inside and the stay, and there's only four of them to keep structure of girls where they should be and tummies where they should be. And, um, <laughs> But I, I've been experimenting. I'll post more in the Sewing for Renaissance page when I start my next one um, and see how it turns out. I'll let you know. The other thing I found with the uh, zip ties is that uh, if you have something coming to a point, the point will flip up. Yes. Because yeah. it's, it's very malleable, especially when it gets hot. I mean, even just your body heat will make it more malleable. Mm -hmm. So you don't put them in anything with a point. Another thing to think about is pad stitching. You were talking about the channels. Um, is that like pad stitching where you yes. use multiple layers of really strong, really um, strong duck like cloth canvas and duck cloth and things like that. And you sew the layers together in such a way that it makes it stronger and less flexible. Mm -hmm. So that's also something to think about if you're like unsure about your boning is look up pad stitching and figure out what's best for you and what will work best. And depending on how historically accurate you want to be and what period you're going for, the pad stitching is more historically accurate than the boning. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you could also use a waist tape, like just get some twill tape to reinforce the waist um, because that will take a lot more stress than other portions of a garment. Um, and if you uh, want, you can actually avoid the boning and use cording instead. And you could actually, yeah. that that can be cheaper depending on what you buy. Um, I've used the same thing you would wrap a turkey in in Thanksgiving. I have slipped that into the channels before. Um, and if you <laughs> braid it, it can make it thicker and bigger. Um, so if you're trying to do it on a budget, that's a much cheaper option to do a whole entire bodice. Um, and it just adds a little bit of stiffness. Um, Corsetmaking.com is where I buy my boning typically. Um, but I've seen 18 inch heavy duty. Yeah, that works too. Another option is uh, reeds, the, like basket reeds. You don't want them individually because they break really easily. So they, they've got to be in, in a bunch, like two or three to a channel. Okay, uh, now moving on, Suzanne's actually going to go over a few things about removing difficult dirt. Um, I learned this yesterday, apparently in the South, uh, the dirt leaves like white staining on white your clothes stains. too. And mm. all almost like um, salt. Yeah. Oh, really? um, we have oh. weird dirt in the South. Um, <laughs> our dirt is bright orange. And when I mean bright orange, like go find a box of crayons and find the color orange, that's our dirt. And it can be devastating to underskirts. It can be 
completely wreck your garb. And so one of the things that, you know, we talk about surviving in garb, but we also want our garb to survive. So I have a couple of tricks that I use, um, three or four. So I'm going to show you first. This is a skirt that I made recently. I'm gonna try to get it close enough to the screen so everybody can see. You see the tool right up underneath the skirt? The skirt has what I call a dust ruffle or a dirt ruffle here in the South. We take some tool onto the bottom of our skirts and about three inches up at the base of the hem, we sew, I've done a demonstrated one in some really ugly yellow so you can see it. We sew a stitch of tool to the bottom of the skirt. Now tool is just nylon fabric that is nice and you can see where the hem is down here. It doesn't stick out super far underneath the skirt, but it catches all of the dirt and the twigs and the branches and all the other things that seem to find me when I am strolling the lanes of our fair. We have a medieval fair, so we have no, um, no asphalt, there's no concrete. We're not in a city park. We're in 44 acres of natural wooded forest. So it is dirt and red mud and lots of leaves all the time. So one of the things is most of my skirts have what I sew in the very bottom is a dirt ruffle. It keeps your skirt hem off the ground and catches all this yucky stuff in here. And it's just a small basting stitch all the way around the bottom of the skirt. And then at the end of the fair, I just pull the basting stitch and throw away the tool. Keeps the hem off the ground. Oh. Second thing, oh, yeah. second trick that I have is if you see this fabric, it is, well, it's a terrible visual of it, but it's basically burnt orange. It's also the color of our dirt. So if you can't beat the stains, just match the stains. So I, I just went for it. Um, the second option I always tell everybody is if you have stains on the bottoms of your hems, use Scotch Guard. Take the inside, not the outside hem, but the inside hem of your dress, hang it up and outside and spray it with Scotch Guard. It is a fabric water shield get the bottom of it. It will not change the color of your fabric. It will not damage your fabric, but Scotch Guard is the only one that I have found that doesn't leave a stain when you spray it. It will make sure that any stain you do end up on the hem of your dress can be washed out. Third trick for big stains, especially food stains, grease stains. I had the lovely um, cook in our kitchen make me a big turkey leg that I then proceeded to drop on the front of my dress this year <laughs> and I had grease all right here so this is a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser you take one of these you take your stain you pour a little baking soda on it dry don't add any liquid to it and you just want to sit there and dab the stain don't rub dab and always work from the inside of the fabric, not the outside of the fabric. It will absorb the stain and hold as much of that baking soda on it as you can. But those are the tricks that I use to get rid of the stains. The other thing that people ask me a lot is when you do work at a fair for 10 hours a day, you're obviously going to be sweaty, especially at our fair, which is 95 degrees usually in the south with 100% humidity and we do sweat a lot especially when we're running all over the place. Um, I don't wash any of my garb in the washing machine unless it's underskirts. Underskirts um, and my chemise will get washed in the washing machine but dresses especially anything that's beaded gets put into a Rubbermaid container. I have a 50 gallon Rubbermaid container that will get warm water and I got this off of Amazon. I don't have it with me because we just moved and I can't find it. But it's called a washing machine agitator. It's about this big, about the size of a smoke alarm. And it sends ultrasonic vibrations through the water in the tub. You add a little wool light, you put your garb in it, you let it sit for 30 minutes. You'll be shocked at the ultrasonic vibrations that will just knock the dirt out of your garb. It doesn't 
hurt it because it's not ripping it around like a washing machine does. But it it has worked on every garb dress I've ever had. It's worked on my velvet dresses. It's worked on my medieval stuff, my linen, um, and even my wool. You put it in the tub, a very small cap of woolite and the agitator, and it, it literally just vibrates the water for about half an hour. And if you want to take good care of your garb and let make it last and also not smell bad, you know, um, I, I suggest getting one. There's the, on Amazon, they're about $28. They're not expensive. Um, I've been using it for about four years and I love it. So What's anybody has any questions, I'll get Kate the link for it and we'll get it posted. Cool. And I will post that down below. Getting better at this YouTube thing. <laughs> uh, so we're going to do a speed round. What's your favorite cooling trick? Fair is 90 degrees. What do you do to try to not overheat? Go. Bone fan. Body scanner. tube full of water, frozen, stuck right between the boobs. Yep, I second the bottle of water frozen between the boobs. Yep. Christy, what was yours? Bodice chiller. It's kind of like the frozen bottle, bottle of water between the boobs. Tube. Bodice chiller. Flexible. I like that one. Mm hmm Slips right up underneath the front of my dress. Stays frozen for about an hour. Uh, are those all your same tips for handling all around sweat while wearing a fitted bodice? Speed round. Go. Cotton. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm so chemise. You get these guards that you, they're like mini pads. You can put them in your armpit area. Yes. And they're supposed to absorb the sweat. Cotton. Totally worth trying. I prefer linen personally. I've, I've tried both cotton and linen, and I prefer linen. The linen does have better um, air movement, I think. Yeah, it, it wicks away the moisture, too. I think that's probably the biggest thing I can recommend to anybody who's doing heat in, in a fair. I know Pens Kate was telling me that Pennsylvania gets really hot in August. Um, I mean, we do a September fair and we do a March fair, and it's usually between 80 and 90 degrees. And it's hot. It's real hot. We had people faint last year, cast members that fainted. We all made fun of them mercilessly because they couldn't hold it, you know. <laughs> um, but that's my number one recommendation is natural fibers in your clothes. And drink water. Lots yes. of water. Lots yes. of water. Yes. Not okay. just water, Gatorade, Powerade, pickles. Pickles. Pickle juice. Oh, yeah. Yep. Pickles. And not pickle backs, just pickles. Pickles. <laughs> There's a running joke in our kingdom. Um, that if you see someone that is looking a little faint, you must chase after them with a pickle. And so all of our patrons get very confused because there's usually someone running after somebody else going, pickle, pickle, pickle. <laughs> Scares them to death. Where's everybody's home fair? Oh. Maryland. Pennsylvania. Nebraska. VA. Alabama. Um, if the ice pack only lasts an hour, what do you do after the first hour? You bring uh, it or leave it in your car. I, well, I'm lucky enough that I have a, a space at mine. I'm a performer at a Renaissance fair. So, um, mm -hmm. I have a space and I have coolers and I dump them back in there and drag them back out in an hour. Um, I have taken what these two fairs that I've just gone to and I just leave it in there. It's still cold. It's not going to stay frozen forever, but it's still cold. I also use these anytime I dress as a peasant. This is a um, tie that goes around your neck, and it's dipped in cold water, and usually you can find around any Renaissance fair, you can find cold water, bottled water, pour it on there, tie it around your neck. I don't do this when I dress in my noble wear, but um, I've gone as a peasant before just to be comfortable and had that around my neck. Kind of swells up like a baby diaper. One of the things that um, the sensitive subject here, the girls. 
Oh. Skin on skin does not work at a fair. So I have to take, whether it's um, little towels, um, paper towels, sometimes napkins if I forgot when I was at home. And if you have the kind that don't stand up on their own and they're gonna lay against your body, you gotta slide something up in between there. Otherwise mm -hmm. it will slide around and you will just sweat and you won't believe the difference just putting something in there that absorbs that and keeps it from being skin on skin. It really does keep you a lot cooler. Okay. How do you handle costume related gatekeeping? Um, how to handle obvious cultural appropriation, historical accuracy versus adequacy, um, and this specifically for plus size people. And we already co covered a little bit of people of color, but just general gatekeeping in the community. And I will say I taught a whole class on historical accuracy or historical adequacy, and I get on a soapbox about that. And that's a whole thing. <laughs> well, things are about fun. And if you're a patron, uh, wear what you want. I mean, as long as it's, not going to make children run away screaming but otherwise <laughs> I mean seriously where would you where would you want to wear um I have had um looks I guess if I wear something that's overly blingy and have kind of out queened the queen um but I dude I made it and I want to look good <laughs> so um, for something like that I just smile and nod and roll on I mean there really isn't much else you can do about it because you're not going to convince them otherwise we had my mom wearing a regency gown this past year at the Ren Fair, and nobody said anything somebody one of the cast member was members was like why didn't you like come dressed you're in your nightgown and we we're like we ran out of time <laughs> kind of make a joke about it if you can and move on. I mean, it's not it's not that serious. And if anybody wants to be that serious about it, I mean, especially face to face, if you're at a fair and somebody comes up to you and says, Why are you wearing that? That's their problem and not yours. You're there to have fun. And if they aren't enjoying themselves and are otherwise critiquing what people around them are wearing, just walk away excuse yourself oh hey look my buddy's over there at that stand i gotta go you know bye don't it doesn't have to be a thing um if it's that online most... and somebody's picking on you on in the group notify one of the moderators yeah. you can report them and have it handled you, you don't have to participate and it will be handled we will handle it i guarantee you I haven't seen any of that in our group. And, and, and generally speaking, I don't see it in our fairs. I mean, we're, we're a tiny fair. When I say we're tiny, we only do 5,000 people. Um, and, and not to, to negate that, but we, <laughs> we're an all volunteer run fair. We are there because we love the, the land. We love the owners. We love the Royals, their family to us. Um, we don't tolerate any bullying. We had a bullying incident at our fair this year. Um, someone is being picked on because of something they were wearing. And those people were quickly escorted right out the gate. I mean, I have a brute force of 17 very large dudes that will take care of it for me at the drop of a hat. But um, I, I encourage our patrons to wear whatever they want to wear. We, we're a medieval fair. We had Batman last year. We loved Batman. We called him a visitor from a different realm, a time traveler. We played into the story and he enjoyed himself. He came back the next year as medieval Batman. It was very interesting. Um, but for anyone dressing above their station or below their station, we don't really get into much of that. We don't have a whole lot of infrastructure at our fair. Um, with regards to titles, but my favorite thing is when a patron dresses like a royal. Um, I'm a lady in waiting at my fair, and I will throw myself on the ground 
in front of them and make a huge deal. Oh, your majesty, I did not know you were approaching. Please beg thy forgiveness and my impertinence at not being at your side. You know, something ridiculous to make them feel um, special. And, you know, I've had people come back and say, you made my day at, at that fair. Thank you. And I've had people that have gotten really uncomfortable when I've done it. Um, you just kind of have to gauge the situation. I don't think anybody has ever in in the history of the fairs that I've gone to around the South, um, LARF, GARF, Tennessee, I don't think I've ever seen an instance of somebody being bullied about garb, but I'm sure um, it's probably more online than it is person to person, like Kathy said. Yeah. What about SCA events? Um, Edna? Um, they've gotten a lot better over the past uh, 15 years or so, uh, because now it's, it's not just Europe anymore. It's any priest uh, 17th century culture is allowed. And so uh, we've got Mongols, we've got Japanese, we've got Chinese, we've got uh, Native American, and it's uh, it's really become more blended, and it's it's absolutely beautiful. I haven't seen much in the way of bullying when it comes to garb. Uh, it, people will give suggestions if it's asked for. I will say that I guess this is a little bit more my world because I come from a historical background initially and that's what then brought me into costuming instead of the other way around um which is why I have a soapbox that I keep especially for this topic um just I we had somebody ask about gatekeeping I guess behind the scenes in a costuming um in the costuming department at a different fair and one, there was some real bullying going on. And my knee-jerk reaction when they're like, how do we get through to them? Because we're supposed to be working with these people is tell them they need therapy, um, which apparently wasn't the best response I could have had knee-jerk on YouTube. But that it, it kind of holds true. You're not going to get through to them. Um, you need to do what makes you happy. And honestly, I dressed as Princess Leia because that's what my three and a half year old decided I needed to dress as to go to the fair for Halloween last year um, mm -hmm. at PA. And I, you know, I had little kids who had probably just seen the movie for the first time thrilled to see me. So I might have this grown adult with nothing better to do judging what I'm wearing, but I just made this child's first time at the fairs day because, oh, look, my husband was Obi-Wan Kenobi, I'm Princess Leia, and we dressed our son up as an Ewok, and my daughter was Luke. So, I mean, it, you, this grown adult might have a problem because I'm historically inaccurate walking down the street of a very paved, historically, like, accurate, I, not, not at all fair, having a good old time. But I made this kid's day. And to me, that's more yeah. important. That's I, more I enjoyed important. it. I made my daughter's day. And I made this random kid's day. So that's kind of how you balance it. And there is no historical accuracy. There's only adequacy at different levels. So that's all I have to say on that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I don't think a whole lot of people are spinning their own wool and dyeing all of their fabric and hand stitching everything. So, no, no, very, but I, very... I talked an hour for that on that th a different class, and I don't think anybody came here to hear me do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, an important topic. It, it really yeah. is. Yeah, because there are people outside of our world that want to judge our world, and I, I just don't understand anybody who would drive all the way to a Renaissance fair just to criticize. I mean... Right. It, just think of how sad that person has to be that that is the highlight of their day right so, so if some you know we at our fair especially we have some strange people trust me we have um we're all volunteers so we take everybody just I, I need volunteers so you know when somebody doesn't quite get it right um i had a gentleman who came dressed in a neon blue leopard print um, and wanted to be on cast. And I said, you know what? Why don't we get you something that's a little more appropriate for your station um, and a couple of thousand years 
backwards. And I took him to our guard tent. We set him up and he was happy as a clam. I didn't have to be ugly about it, but he had made an effort and I wanted to acknowledge that effort. And in the end, he looked great and um, became a big hit with a bunch of the kids. So, you know, I think it's all just about including instead of, you know, separating people into classes. It's just not what we do. I mean, you see it more online, especially yeah. if you leave, you see it less in our group on Facebook, but if you're going into any of the like Victorian dress groups or like um, historical costuming specific groups, you'll see it a lot more get it, people getting criticized on, oh, your lacing's the wrong way, or that's not how you do that stitch or anything like that. And that's the world I kind of came from before coming over to, and I've been to Renaissance fairs way before, but like I majored in history. So what got me into it was my major. Um, so just ignore the online trolls or if you really have nothing better to do, troll them back, I guess. I don't know. I'm a millennial. <laughs> we do that. Um, it depends on how prickly you want to be and how much you want to upset the admins, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um comfy shoes for rocky fairs go <laughs> what what shoes comfy shoes comfy. that aren't going to hurt your feet at Man, i am fairs all that about are I, I know that every now and then you find a really good steal these came off of amazon i don't even know what they are or where i got them but do you see the bottoms Ooh. Nice. Oh, okay. Very nice. This is the best thing that I have found for terrain. And I have foot issues. They are 100% leather and they breathe. Real leather breathes. Pleather does not. Exactly. So, um, you know, they are historically oh. accurate except for the soles. <laughs> Kathy, you were trying to say something? I was just asking what they were called. I, I don't know. I've had them so long. They've worn off all um i will see if i can find the link though if you can send me the link i'll post it down below <laughs> yeah. they were cheap they, they um they were on amazon for like 34 bucks so i will find the link and send it to cat please kathy uh, did you want to so we have sneakers we have the awesome amazon shoes that i want the name of and kathy yes. did you have <laughs> Um, for me, um, this past year, I mean, always I've had to wear something that has a thicker sole because if not, I, I will crunch my, um, oh, my arch and it, it will just be painful. So anything with a thicker sole, preferably rubber because sometimes it can get slickery out there. Um, but the other thing is, um, what was it? About, uh, six months ago, my arch has dropped. So I'm like, okay, now what do I wear? <laughs> um, but I have found uh, they're a little more expensive, but whatever I get now, um, and, I've, and I found a couple pairs that I can wear. They look like Mary Janes, but they have like a thicker back um, that heel support. If you can get something that has ankle support, so much the better, because the last thing you want to do is turn an ankle on a rock as you're walking through the pathways. Um, also, the best thing I ever did two years ago was get insoles for all of those wonderful boots that I bought. Um, Son of Sandlar, um, Medieval Moccasins, and uh, Catskill. All of those are wonderful shoes, but they do not have any kind of arch support at all. So um, when you go, if you're going to buy something like that, please take a pair of insoles with you and it will save your feet. You'll be able to walk a lot longer. Um, open toes, I love wearing them because they're cool, especially those medieval moccasins. But damn if I don't get a rock in there every hour. Dirt, rock, <laughs> stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so those are kind of hard um, unless you get them a size bigger and then they can close up completely but um try to stay away from those and, and try to get the closed up ones if you're going to go expensive vionic and birkenstock both have some really good shoes that you could wear to a fair and nobody will punish you if you decide to wear tennis shoes under your dress or with yeah. your pants oh, nobody yeah. will nobody will say a word because 
you being comfortable is way better than you having your fair experience ruined by aching feet. Yeah. Exactly. I've seen if people you're... wear hiking boots or hiking shoes or um, stability sneakers are really good if you have foot problems, but you should go get them fitted and they're not cheap. Um, but I, yeah, I, yeah, I wear boots that you would wear like horseback riding. So a lot of ankle support. If you're on a budget, a good uh, brand is Earth Shoe. Um, Yes, I got a pair last year. They're wonderful. I love them so much. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. They are really good. So that and is Earth Shoe. Yes, Earth Shoe. Okay. Yeah, they've uh, they have some padding in them, and the, the nice thick rubber soles. And uh, yeah, they're they're marvelous. Any way to disguise sneakers, guys? I don't. I just I wear my regular sneakers to the fair, and I get weird looks. But I have to wear sneakers. I can't wear anything else if I'm going to be on my feet 10, 12 hours a day walking around at a fair. It's just not going to work. I don't even try. I've made plenty of boot covers for the guys at our fairs. They want to wear tennis shoes. Um, if they're not, I mean, seriously, you can Google a pattern for boot covers. Mm -hmm. It's a semicircle and a, a, a cylinder shaft. It's, you know, you just lace them up the back and... They go right over and fit the top of your sneakers. Um, most of our guys, because we're in a medieval period, have leg wraps. So they cover up their boots with the leg wraps. Um, but yeah, you can get a really good pattern for a boot cover and make it out of anything you want. Mm -hmm. Black shoes. No one looks twice at black shoes when you're walking in mud or dirt. Black sneakers. Nope. If you can find brown, if you're lucky enough to find brown, that's good too. Yeah. Bionic and Birkenstock um, from the chat just got recommended. But yeah, no one, like if you're wearing bright white sneakers, people kind of look at you like you have two heads sometimes if you're in this like really pretty garb and wearing white like tennis shoes. But no one seems to look twice if they're black or brown. So. Exactly. Um, Clark's makes a good mule um, that has good arch support. Clark. Um, yes, and clocks they're, are all yes. I love clocks. dark colors, and they're made out of leather. So, and most of them are hand stitched. So you're getting, you know, you're a little bit of accuracy there. Yeah, okay. there you go, clocks. We're gonna do another uh, quick tips round. Um, why are uh, why are there no full length mirrors in the privy so we can readjust after making room for more ale? Um, do you have any quick tips on readjusting? PA has a full length mirror. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, it does. And I am so grateful for that. So I don't have any tips. We don't have that problem here. Okay. We right have now. a green room. We have a green room where people can go and adjust. And I put a full length mirror in there and a privacy curtain. Um, is that, that just for cast or is that for No, people? anybody can use it. Okay. It's right near the bathrooms. It's just a very small pavilion tent that we pop up that says um, garb adjustments. Okay. <laughs> and they can go in and do what they need to do. Um, I think you bring a friend. Yeah, you bring a friend. I think for anybody um, that has to do it on their own, I've had to go and readjust things on my own. Uh, I think your best bet is to just do the best you can, make sure you're not showing anything, and um, grab your closest confidant and say, hey, am I hanging out, you know? <laughs> Most of the, like, female cast that I've talked to, if you're like, uh, did I tuck this in right, they'll, they'll be like, yeah, you're good, or like, oh, no, fix this. Like, the cast is usually, like, pretty helpful if you actually, like, look like you need, like, they won't kid around with you as much if you actually need help. Um, that's, and your folks are so helpful. Yeah. Um, so like they might joke with you if you look like particularly you have it all together, but if you actually need help, they tend to be helpful. They're not going to play with you about that. Um, base layers and materials, your favorite. Oh, can yeah. I add something else? Oh, can I add something else real quick? Yes. Yeah. There are a couple of vendors. Um, they're usually at a, a lot of the fairs. Um, Maresca, Wolfstone Kilt Company, and Noblesse Oblige. All three of those, if you walk in and like, oh, oh my God, I have no idea if I've laced this correctly or I'm spilling out or my lacing broke, they will help you. All, all of three of those stores will too. And if your um, fair has a rental 
area for renting costumes for the day, they will help you with costume mess ups as well. And of course, you can also ask somebody in the privy as you're coming out, hey, any white showing? <laughs> and they're usually good about it. Yeah. And if you're going to like a corset costume or a lot of them will have a full length mirror just because they're selling and fair people tend to be the nicest people you ever meet. So um, base layers and materials, your favorite base layer and the material it's made out of. Kathy, starting with you. Speed round. Go. Linen shorts. Linen shorts. Christy. Uh, my linen chemise. Okay. Suzanne. Oh, chemise. Uh, you said what? Gauze. Cotton gauze. Gauze chemise. Okay. Aiden? My linen chemise. Linen chemise. I like cotton chemise because I don't like sewing linen. Believe it or not, it works too. Mm -hmm. I sweat at the drop of a hat and cotton still will stick a little bit, but rayon and linen, they're fine. I'm fine with those. Yeah, I chase after two kids on a daily basis. I don't care about sweat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how to stay cool in synthetic upholstery fabric. Do, do we feel we covered that or is that its own topic? There is no way to stay cool in polyester upholstery Not fabric. Really. Uh, get you a bodice chiller. That's about it. Bodice chiller and natural fibers next to your skin. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, if you can keep the, the linen or the cotton or the rayon close to your skin, the outer layers aren't as bad, including leather. Yep. Or and leather. Uh, going to the fair with kids. Oh, geez. What are the best things to take them to see or do to keep them entertained and not destroy their garb? That depends on the fair that you're going to. Every fair has different attractions and different things going on as far as story-wise. Jousts are always a huge hit with my kids. Um, it takes all day to get there, but, I mean, yeah, they enjoy right. it. Um, how to keep them from destroying their garb. I tend to not dress my kids up just because they're 9 and 10. And destruction are their middle names mm -hmm. um if i'm going to dress them up it's probably going to be just a linen shirt or a cheap cotton muslin shirt and jeans or shorts something that they're going to be comfortable in i don't worry about them and washable yeah something washable make sure it's washable, washable. Oh, god make oh, sure yeah. um washable. scrub pants Women's scrub pants, if you get an extra small, is like a child's 12. I mean, you can you can really get them down small. Um, my kid is eight. He comes to fair and is there for eight full hours of the day. Um, I don't see him most of the day, so God knows what he's up to. But uh, he always comes back in one piece. So there's scrub pants and a plain cotton white shirt that... You know, I think I got off of Wish for like a dollar. Um, just don't invest too much in your kid's garb because they'll outgrow it and they'll destroy it. Um, but the best thing to do with kids at a fair is to make sure that they have kid attractions. Do not take small children to a Renaissance fair that is geared towards adults because they will be bored and drive you crazy. Um, one of the things that we have been trying to incorporate more of in our fair is more attractions for the kids. So one of the things we have is instead of an Easter egg hunt, we have a dragon egg hunt. And there are thousands of concrete dragon eggs all over my kingdom. And the kids find them and they bring them and they put them in a basket and they feel like they get a treat. And just make sure that there's stuff for them to do. I have young kids, so I got tips because I put them in garb and I forced them to the fair. And they don't got a choice because they're just learning how to talk. Um, <laughs> no, mommy, no! Yeah. Uh, so my daughter's first trip to the fair was at five months. I put her in a dress. That dress was stretchy. That dress could easily come off and it could easily fit either long sleeves under it or nothing under it, depending on the weather of PA at that particular moment. Because if today is any indication, we know it goes from 70 degrees to snow squalls today. And that's what we've had multiple of. Um, so stretchy, uh, washable, 
dark tones unless you're in the south Mm -hmm. because that weird salt like staining stuff that we don't we don't have that up here I guess um I make my daughter costumes that I can just keep adding ruffles to the bottom and it has something that, mm-hmm. that you could add in lacing. So it can just keep going wider and wider and get more ruffles. And then I don't need to remake it every year. Um, I have my own backpack that that particular toy and that particular coloring book only comes out if we're at the fair, which means that if mommy and daddy want to watch a sp- particular show and that child is not as interested in that show, they only get the toy for that particular particular day or that particular span of time so they're more interested in sitting there and coloring in their book um taking them to a place that they can run free planning your meals around nap time making sure that they can actually fall asleep in the stroller or wherever you're bringing them and then eating in a quiet place while that happens um don't eat what everybody else is eating because waiting in line with toddlers is a bad idea Mm -hmm. Um, those are my tips for surviving the fair. Oh, and don't wear a hoop skirt because you're going to chase your toddler through the crowd. And if your toddler gets through the crowd quicker than you do, you're going to lose your toddler in the crowd. And a hoop skirt is harder to navigate a crowd. So when both of them have learned to stay slightly more still, I will introduce my hoop skirt back. (laughs) But until then, it stays at home and becomes a tent for them because it makes a perfect tent. (laughs) (laughs) Um... Sneakers are useful if you have toddlers. Just, just saying. Yeah. Something one of my friends did was uh, she took it's a Viking apron dress, and it's uh, it's got tucks in it. So as the kid grows, she can take the tucks out. <laughs> oh, that's neat. Oh, and a baby. If you have a baby boy, don't try to put him in like a nice garb. Put him in a kilt because you can easily change a diaper. Mm-hmm. Yep. Girl dress, you just flip the dress up. Boy trying to deal with them in PA no. doesn't, has one changing room area really. So like you're changing them in the, the, the forest, but mm-hmm. kilts, kilts, they don't know any different. They have no clue. They won't learn that they they're in a kilt until they're older and by then it's too late. It's okay, <laughs> they'll survive. They can argue their Scottish heritage later. Yeah. We'll get them a DNA test. I'm sure there's yeah. something English- Celtic, Scottish, <laughs> somewhere in there for somewhere, but Celts are glorious for young children. Well, and in, in the historical times, they dressed boys and girls the same as uh, the same anyway. So. Yeah, until a certain age, they were in in uh, sacks. Yeah, sack dresses. And, and, yeah, they were in sack dresses, but you get less yeah. looks if you dress your boy in a kilt than if you do in a sack dress. Sack dress. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> And you're spending enough time as a parent defending every little thing you do that that's just one argument I don't feel like having with people yeah. up there. Um, are there any topics you want to see us cover? This is kind of last call for topics for both the panelists and our chat. Last minute comments. If you want to join Scott, do you have any tips for that because I don't think we've really covered anything SCA specific. Any like survival tips for SCA? Uh, so the SCA, it's pretty easy to join sca.org. They've got a, a group finder so you can find your local group and most of them have a Facebook presence. So you can, uh, you can find their Facebook page and talk to the shadowing. Yes, it's the shadowing you want to talk to. And they'll they'll be able to direct you to the people to help you get involved. Join SCA, join your local fair. They're always looking for casts. I know we oh, are. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you want to volunteer, find your local fair and call them up and find their Facebook page. They'll usually respond on Messenger. Um, I've done you know a couple of different ones in Alabama and. We're kind of branching out. We're going to LARF this year. Um, but you're not going to find anybody, any group in the world that'll be more welcoming than Rennings. They are accepting wonderful people and they are there to help and teach you. I've learned so much from my family of fair people, um, sewing things, non-sewing things, Um I think that your best bet for surviving in garb or surviving any fair is to get in with a good group. 
And you can always reach out if you see somebody that is local to your group on Sewing for Renaissance Festival's Facebook group and they mention that they're going to a particular fair. I mean, we all tend to be a pretty friendly group. Like Christy and I go to the same fair and now we know that. Um, so um, maybe we'll run into each other, but we know to look out for each other. So just building a community is a good idea. And that's why we're all here. Yeah, we've done this a couple of times at Maryland where we actually had a Sewing for Renaissance Festivals meetup. Um, oh, cool. Put out a spread of food. Um, you know, people just come and go. We stay there for a couple of hours and people come and introduce themselves, have a little snack or something. And I think y'all took a food. big group picture, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, I saw, I saw that picture. <laughs> You look but great. <laughs> that's, oh, thank you. Thank you. It's That's like a really um, fun thing to do. And if you have a couple of your friends already that belong to the group, that's one way to do it. And, and to, meet, to meet others in your area, mm -hmm. that is. So I'm just going to close us up uh, by saying thank you for joining us for this whole time. We hope that you found this useful. Um, if you have any other questions for us or have an idea for a class, Feel free to find me on Sewing for Renaissance Festivals. I comment all over the place. My name is Kate Marie Turnipseed. Feel free to message me and we can uh, figure out other fun topics or panels or we'll go from there. Uh, since this is going to be uploaded to YouTube, let's try this YouTube thing again. I'm just great at it. Uh, if you look up here, uh, you'll see a little button of another video you might be interested in over here. Uh, please uh, subscribe. And if you want to get notifications whenever we upload something to YouTube, press the little uh, button down below and there's an icon and you'll get notified. Um, until then, thank you for joining us and take care. Bye. Bye.